Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another video. We're a couple days removed from our significant severe weather event that took aim at parts of the Southern Plains, particularly Oklahoma, back on Sunday, February 26th. It was a very interesting event meteorologically, as well as watching it progress in real time. So I thought we'd go ahead and do a post-mortem analysis on this event. Uh, this was a very well forecast, very prolific event. You can see a number of damaging wind, including some significant wind reports there across much of the Texas Panhandle into southern Oklahoma, as well as several tornado reports. There were a few tornadoes, including some down near Hobart, Oklahoma, as you can see from the images here. And most notably, there was an EF2 tornado that occurred in the southern and eastern parts of Norman, producing some pretty significant damage. It was a pretty uh, intense day for me on Sunday. Was out chasing out in the eastern Texas panhandle into western Oklahoma. Got back to Oklahoma City around 9 p.m. or so, watched the tornado go through Yukon, but was eyeing that the Norman supercell intently as it was forming uh, west of town and had a pit in my stomach knowing that it would, it would wrap up and take a path that was very close to where I live as well as a lot of my friends live. So. Uh, that was a little bit interesting as the tornado passed just less than a mile north of where I live. Uh, so very fortunate to have been spared. Uh, but as you can see here, mo many folks were not quite as fortunate just off to my north. So I uh, do want to thank everyone for the uh, well wishes over the last couple of days. Uh, it's been uh, pretty surreal to see this happen in places that I frequent on a daily basis here in Norman. So uh, hoping these folks can get back on their feet very soon. Uh, and that the recovery process is a quick one. But uh, all in all, a very interesting event and one that deserves some interest, some uh, deep meteorological analysis. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. As we said, this was a very well forecast event. This was the uh, day two uh, event, day two SPC outlook, day three SPC outlook also had an enhanced risk down here. And they eventually honed in on that corridor across much of Western Oklahoma. This was the initial day one, and then the day one at 13Z, broad, moderate risk. And as you can see by the uh, verification here, they did a very good job in forecasting the eventual uh, path of the greatest damaging winds and tornado threat there. So excellent job by the forecast offices in this area, as well as the SPC, at nailing the forecast once again for this potent event. So let's do start our meteor meteorological analysis the day before, so February 25th. If you may remember, if you live in the Southern Plains, we had had a previous cold frontal intrusion and we were socked in clouds and cold air up here in Oklahoma into much of Texas for the pre preceding couple of days leading up to the February 26th event. And the main concern with this event was moisture return. Would those dew points, which had not been swept fully into the Gulf, as is often the case in these wintertime systems, they were really sitting off just the Southeast Texas coast here, but the question was, would those dew points have enough time to get far enough north to produce a robust severe threat across the target area? And that was the main question going into this, going into the days leading up to the event. And what was adding to my concerns that the moisture might not make it up there was the degree of cloud cover and cold air really entrenched across much of Texas. We'll take a look at our visible satellite from the morning of February 25th. And you can see this entire area from Oklahoma down into much of Texas socked in clouds and cold air. We look at our surface temperatures here. 20s up here in Oklahoma on Saturday morning down to the 30s and 40s down here into much of Texas. So that cold air was really hanging on across this area. And I was a little bit unsure whether or not we would make that moisture would be able to make it its way up into Oklahoma for Sunday's event. But... What alleviated my concerns pretty quickly was the degree of clearing across Texas throughout much of the day. We'll go through the loop here, and you can see some pretty robust clearing across parts of South Texas and Southeast Texas there, um, which allowed that moisture to start creeping northward. Here's what the satellite looked like at 22Z on the 25th, so Saturday at about 4 p.m., and you can see very rampant clearing across this region, uh, which helped to get some solar heating down to the surface and really heat those low levels up and mix out 
that that cold air that was really entrenched into the region. Because if that cold air were to stick around, that moisture would really not be able to make its way northward as that cold air acts as, as somewhat of a dam and is very difficult to move in a lot of situations if you can't mix it out. But we got a lot of clearing across that area, so I was not too worried that we were able to, not too worried about the uh, prospects of getting that moisture northward, uh, at least from uh, the effects of that cold air. The um, timing of the trough is something that was also of concern. We'll talk about that in a second. We take a look at our dew points here. You can see this is at 14Z, so the morning of February 25th. Those 60s dew points just hanging out across far southeast Texas and along the Texas coast there. 60s dew points into 70s, sitting right in there. But the winds were northerly across this region. Behind that cold front that had pushed off and kind of stalled out here across the Texas coast, those winds were northerly uh, and not allowing that moisture to creep northward through the day on Saturday, uh, so it seemed. We wanted to see that, number one, that clearing across South Texas, and number two, these winds start to flip around to more easterly or southeasterly through much of the day to start allowing that moisture to creep northward, and that's exactly what happened. You'll notice as we go on in this loop, those 60s dew points start creeping inland just a little bit, and by the afternoon of uh, the 25th, so Saturday afternoon, Across a wide region here, Oklahoma down into much of Texas, the winds had definitely started to flip around a little bit, and east, a much more easterly or southeasterly, even southerly component to a lot of the winds across this area, and that was a promising sign to get that moisture up to the north. You can already see some of the, some, that moisture return starting just a little bit. The, the 60 dew point isodrosotherm there had definitely crept inland quite a bit throughout the day on Saturday. So that was a good sign, and that really alleviated my concerns that the uh, models were going to be uh, a little too robust with moisture return and that moisture would not quite make its way up there. So very promising uh, set sign there on Saturday for getting moisture up into the target on Sunday. Uh, now let's go ahead and look at our um, uh, upper air maps. We'll start out at 500 millibars. This, is starts, this starts at 15Z on the 26th, so Sunday morning at about 9 a.m. As we had said in our forecast discussion, very compact, very powerful trough across the desert southwest. Very strong winds rounding the base of that trough. That is 100 uh, plus knot winds there in a little a little jet streak uh, in the exit, uh, approaching the exit region of that trough. This wave was very compact though. The wavelength not all that long. So this was going to be fairly progressive. Again, we've talked about this before. You can estimate the uh, speed of movement of these troughs by looking at how long the wavelength is between the axis of the trough and the axis of the accompanying ridge. And you can see that that is very short. When it's about the size of the US or greater, it's not gonna move a whole lot. When it's very small like this, it's going to move off toward the east very, very quickly. And that's exactly what this trough was forecast to do and what it did do throughout the day on Sunday. You can see very rapid movement off toward the east. This is at zero Z. Very strong winds, again, rounding the base of that trough, very compact nature of the trough that allowed for some uh, robust severe storm development there Sunday evening, Sunday late afternoon and evening across the Texas Panhandle up into parts of southwest Kansas. So very potent trough that allowed for these fast-moving storms across the region. And again, so the, the question again was moisture return with this system. And if you'll notice here, the timing, we talked about this in the forecast discussion video in the days and morning leading up to the event, that the timing of the ejection of this trough is going to be critical in initiating lee cyclogenesis to the east of the Rockies, somewhere in southeast Colorado, which would then really strengthen those low-level winds and start to pull that moisture northward very rapidly into the region. I did post this. I posted this graphic on social media, um, I believe the day before, maybe a couple days before uh, the event, and this was just showing the surface dew points valid at 0Z on the 27th, so the 6 p.m. Central Standard Time on Sunday. And there was a lot of model spread in the moisture return leading up to, even up to the day of the event, there was still quite a bit of discrepancy in the moisture return. The global models, GFS and the European model, were very robust with the moisture return. The leading edge of the, the blue contours here, that's the 60 dew point isodrosotherm, was quite far north, well into Oklahoma by 0Z on Sunday, by the evening on Sunday. European model, even more robust than the GFS, while the NAM was, and some of the convective allowing models were quite a bit slower with the moisture return. And I had remarked in the forecast video on 
Sunday morning that I thought the NAM solution would be a lot closer to reality as the NAM tends to handle these cold wintertime air masses a lot better than the global model. So I thought something closer to the NAM solution, although I thought it might be a li even still a little bit less robust than what it could be, would be something close to reality. And if we compare our um, forecast here with the actual surface data, let me go through a little bit here to 0z. So here we have it 0z, and you'll notice the 60s dew points have made it up into far southwest Oklahoma, basically right along the Red River there into southern Oklahoma. That is about what the NAM was showing. You can see here as we go back, the NAM was very, very similar in having those dew points get up into a very similar region, maybe just a tad farther north in reality, something closer to what the ARW and NSSL were for showing. But overall, the NAM ended up handling this uh, the best out of all the main models, which includes the global models, as it does tend to handle these wintertime cold air masses a bit better than the global model. So the NAM solution did come to fruition fairly well, uh, and we eventually got 60 dew points up into the Red River vicinity by the evening on Sunday. So that mixing out of the cold air down in Texas allowed that moisture uh, reservoir to be ready to be pulled northward, but we needed some surface features uh, to help us pull that moisture northward, and that was the other question as far as moisture return goes. That was the timing of the trough ejection and the associated Lee cyclogenesis or surface load development somewhere out here in southeast Colorado. What time that was going to happen was going to be critical in determining the speed and timing of that moisture return. And because the trough was hanging back so much, this is at 15z, 9 a.m. on uh, Sunday morning, the trough was yet to uh, make its way over the Rockies, and you need that southwesterly flow to uh, traverse the Rockies, and then you'll get surface load development somewhere on the east side of the Rockies. And you can see that didn't happen until about midday. We started to see that plume of stronger winds associated with that jet streak uh, with the trough started to traverse the Rockies, and that at that point, we finally started to see surface load development out here in southeast Colorado, and that at that time, low-level winds started to back and really strengthen across this region, and that moisture started to pull northward about, about lunchtime or so on Sunday. So if we had had a little bit uh, more progressive, a little bit quicker trough, that moisture would, would we wouldn't have an issue getting that moisture northward uh, in time. But because of the late arrival or late ejection of this trough and associated later surface cyclogenesis, we were a little bit concerned that it wouldn't make its way up there. Uh, but we did get robust surface load development. We'll take a look down at our uh, surface chart here. And you'll notice early on, we don't see much of a surface low feature there in southeast Colorado, but over the next couple of hours, that changed pretty drastically. You can see the pressures drop pretty quickly from 1,000 to 994 there by 20Z there in southeast Colorado, northeast New Mexico, western Oklahoma panhandle. And that continued to consolidate and strengthen 990 millibar low there by 23Z. Uh, so l very late afternoon, early evening on Sunday, very strong surface low there, very strong pressure gradient on, on the backside here, as well as ahead of this surface low, which yielded some very strong non-thunderstorm winds across New Mexico, some dust storm uh, issues there in, uh, some blowing dust issues there in New Mexico, and very strong winds out in the warm sector, really started to help pull that moisture northward very rapidly. Uh, and because of the robustness of the surface low, we were able to get that moisture up relatively far enough north to about the Red River just north by 0Z to allow those storms to um, eat, eat that up and be, become severe there uh, Sunday evening. So very interesting uh, um, progression with this particular event. You can see the surface low continues to deepen there as we go into the um, nighttime hours, 988 millibar low up there in Kansas, cold front, very progressive cold front there. Um, out uh, extending from that surface low. So a very robust surface pattern developed because of the strength and compact, compact nature uh, of the trough. That also means we had a very strong low level jet develop. Let me back this up. This is 850 millibars. So right away, early morning on, the, on Sunday, not a very strong mass response there in the low levels, but watch what happens with time very strong low-level uh, cyclone development, and we saw the low-level jet spike to about 80 knots or so, 70 to 80 knots across much of Oklahoma into Texas by early evening on Sunday. And that helped to, number one, continue that low-level moisture return in a very rapid fashion, and number two, it increased the low-level shear to, to obscene amounts. And we're going to take a look at some soundings here in a second. 
just absolutely obscene uh, wind profiles with this particular event uh, that helped aid in the strong tornado threat across the region. So looking at the surface data, you can see this is at 12Z on Sunday morning. Those dew points, those 60s and 70s dew points had made some pretty decent inland progress into Texas. And we actually had a little extra plume of those 60s dew points up into the Edwards Plateau here near Sonora and Junction, Texas. That was a little bit interesting as that was a little bit closer than models had, a little bit more northward than models had had that line at this time on uh, Sunday morning. So that was able to advance pretty nicely once that surface load developed in southeast Colorado up into the northwest Texas and Red River vicinity there in southwest Oklahoma. So pretty good moisture return already underway, but that would really strengthen as you can, as we go into the afternoon hours, you'll see these winds really strengthen uh, in the open warm sector to 20, 15, 20, 25 knots out across a broad swath of much of Texas. And as a result, those 60s dew points really got pulled northward by uh, 20Z, so 2 p.m., those 60s dew points all the way up here to Graham, Texas, just south of Wichita Falls. And so those dew points making a very good northward progress uh, with a dry line developing somewhere in the Texas panhandle. Dew points there in New Mexico in the 30s, 40s, and 50s across the Texas panhandle. So somewhere in this vicinity, I would put the dry line trailing cold front back here in New Mexico still as that low was developing, but dry line setting up uh, and that would be an impetus for storm development initially uh, in the late afternoon hours before the cold front overtook things in the early evening. Uh, you'll see temperatures warm there into the 70s. We were actually a little, uh, in the morning, we were quite socked in cloud cover. This is the visible satellite from, the, from uh, Sunday morning. You'll see a lot of cloud cover across the region, but some pretty rapid clearing from west to east as that trough uh, progressed eastward into New Mexico. We got clearing, quite a bit of clearing, and uh, eventually uh, very nice clearing there, warming, temperatures warm very nicely there in northwest Texas into the 70s with that moisture creeping up into the low 60s as far as dew points go. A little bit concerned about this particular swath or this particular batch of clouds that was a little bit uh, stubborn in eroding across this region. You can see those cloud streets in here, those little ripples in the flow. That indicates low level stability. So we were watching that and I think that's what the NAM was modeling across this region. If you recall in some of the earlier forecast discussions we did, we saw that the NAM was quite cold in this particular vicinity right here, had temperatures only in the low 50s. And I think it was, was modeling this batch of low level clouds that was a little bit tough to erode. Now the NAM, of course, is, was still way too cool with those temperatures, and this batch of clouds didn't have too much trouble eroding into the late afternoon hours. Uh, you can see there, especially with southern extent, that that uh, low-level stability definitely eroded quite a bit across the southeast Texas Panhandle into southwest Oklahoma. <laughs> those clouds did hang on a little bit there across western Oklahoma, perhaps had an, an impact on the relative lack of robust severe weather in this region up in northwest Oklahoma. We did, we did have a strong tornado here near Kelton, Texas in toward Cheyenne, Oklahoma that did some pretty significant damage there. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but those low level clouds, low level, low level stability was a little bit difficult to erode. And thus I think there was a slightly more robust severe threat down in southwest Oklahoma where SPC did have that 10% tornado risk uh, as the low level stability was not quite as strong there. If we look back at our surface data, uh, you'll see that, that uh, those temperatures there were a little bit slow to rebound, um, but you see it's Childress there, 76 over 57, 70 degrees there at Frederick. So that area down in southwest Oklahoma, far northwest Texas, was the prime spot it looked like for um, more robust severe development, um, both ahead of the dry line and as the cold front pushed east. Storms initially fired in the far western Texas panhandle, up through the Oklahoma panhandle in southwest Kansas. And these storms up here in southwest Kansas would eventually mature first and become our first uh, legitimate severe threat of the day. Let me switch to the Dodge City radar here. So our Dodge City radar is right over here. And these storms would move into southwest Kansas and attain a tornado threat. You can see some supercellular characteristics with these. Somewhat of a messier uh, mode up in here, but you can definitely see some supercell characteristics within these storms. They would congeal and uh, become a mix of somewhat somewhat linear segments to some semi-discrete supercells as they move toward Dodge City. And I've gotten some questions about this particular activity that the moisture was not even close to what it was down south. The instability was very weak. 
So why did these storms produce tornadoes up here? We had a couple of tornado reports up in this region, as you see on our map. You can see a couple of tornado reports up there in the, in the, on the Kansas-Oklahoma border up toward southwest Kansas. Well, let's take a look at a Dodge City wrap proximity sounding. This is at 23Z as those tornadoes were ongoing just to the west on Sunday evening. So you can see at the surface, it's 66 over 50. So even though it's a 50 dew point, let's take a look at the temperature dew point spread. And that is about 16 degrees. And that is well within the range for that we'd like to see for tornadic supercells. I usually use a rule of thumb of 20 degrees of our temperature dew point spread. This one has a 16 degree spread, so well within the range, even though our 60s dew points are still well to the south down in northwest Texas at this point. So it doesn't matter the exact value of the dew point. Just because you have a 50 degree dew point does not mean you're not gonna see tornadoes. It's all about the temperature dew point spread and the other ingredients in the environment. Our temperature dew point spread relatively low, lower than what we're seeing, lower than what we, we our threshold is for tornadic activity, 66 over 50. So there was, so definitely no concerns there as far as uh, a tornado threat goes just by looking at the temperature dew point spread. Now, 50 degree dew point also, in southwest Kansas, maybe a little bit higher than other areas. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. This is a topo topographical map of southwest Kansas, and as you can see here, our elevation out west is much higher than it is with eastern extent. So we do have perhaps somewhat of a minor upslope component or, or somewhat of a terrain component up here. And as we've talked about before, a dew point of 55 degrees at Denver, Colorado is much different than a dew point of 55 degrees in Oklahoma City, which is much lower elevation. Air at higher altitudes holds much can hold much less moisture. So a dew point of 55 in Denver, Colorado is actually very is actually quite juicy whereas in Oklahoma, a 55 dew point is generally considered to be on the margins for severe weather activity or at least tornadic activity. So a 50 dew point here in southwest Kansas may actually mean a little bit more than it would say in far eastern Kansas or down into central Oklahoma. So because just because we have a 50 degree dew point here does not mean that tornadic activity is out of the question. We do have nice temperature dew point spreads, some modest elevated instability above this capping inversion, which about 500 joules per kilogram of mixed layer cape. And even though we had this capping inversion, we're going to come back to this later for our Oklahoma tornado cases. This capping inversion was able to be broken. It was very stout. You can see a very stout elevated mixed layer here, 9.2 degrees Celsius per kilometer lapse rate within that layer. So very uh, potent elevated mix layer working its way back in. But because we were in such close proximity to the surface low, I believe helped to erode this cap. We were also along the dry line slash cold front eventually that would overtake this particular region. So for, uh, if you don't have the ability to erode the cap from the synoptic scale features, the mesoscale features, your frontal zones, you need some sort of impetus to push air up through this capping inversion. And that's what we had here. A little bit of extra lift from just being at right ahead of the surface low there in Southwest Kansas, as well as near the dry line slash cold front, helped to push the air through this stable layer. And because we had very strong deep layer and low level shear, as you can see from the photograph, zero to one kilometer storm relative velocity over 200 meters squared per second squared and deep layer shear approaching 60 knots, that is able to uh, create some pressure perturbation uh, action that helps to drill through that stable layer, and therefore you can get tornadic activities in this kind of profile. We talked about that in the Greensburg, Kansas tornado case study a couple of videos back. I'll put a link to that in the description box below as well. But if you have, oftentimes in these uh, nocturnal events, and this is not quite nocturnal, this was just before sunset here, but in these nocturnal events, the cap tends to grow, grow back in over the first few hours after the sun sets. The surface cools faster than the air above it, so you get an inversion to work its way back in. And therefore, you'd think that the tornado threat would be would lessen after dark. Well, if you have very strong deep layer and low level shear, that can create some pressure perturbations that can help to drill through that stable layer and produce significant tornadoes in light of the capping inversion that builds back in. So very similar situation here as well. Uh, and we had a favorable thermodynamic profile in the low levels for tornadoes. And therefore, even though we had only 500 joules per kilogram of mixed layer cape, that's enough when you have a shear profile like this. All you need is a little en enough instability to sustain robust updrafts, and the shear is going to do the rest. So that is why we were able to get tornadoes in southwest Kansas, despite somewhat of a less favorable environment up there. So back down to the Amarillo radar. We had numerous storms develop along and just ahead of the dry line. Lots of updrafts in here uh, that went up all at once. 
and that made for a little bit of a messy mode at first. But we did have some semi-discrete supercells fire out there. You can actually see the cold front from behind here, and that would light up eventually with a lot of storms along it. These were just on the dry line ahead of it. And you can see a bunch of different somewhat semi-discrete elements within the line. Our first interest was this particular supercell right here. It took on a very interesting shape, had some rotation with it, um, but and had some good structure with it. Looked a little grungy. Maybe it may have moved into that stable pocket of air that we talked about a little bit earlier from those tough to erode clouds out in here. Uh, so that may have been a, a tempering influence with these storms. Second storm, be just to the southwest of those storms, was our second storm of interest. That started to perk up on radar. We got out ahead of it near Sweetwater, Oklahoma, and there was some chaser footage of a tornado, a brief tornado that it produced as it crossed the state line, and it would eventually produce the strong Cheyenne tornado, Cheyenne, Oklahoma tornado that did some pretty significant damage within town. This is our vantage point of this storm, and you can see a pretty classic structure to this storm lowering right in here, what appears to be a rear flank downdraft cut. The rear flank downdraft, for those of you who are not familiar, is the current of air that wraps around the backside or rear flank of a mesocyclone. Let's say we have our supercell here. The mid-level winds are going to enter that supercell and they get wrapped around the mesocyclone and get pushed downward through vertical pressure perturbations, negative buoyancy, etc. We'll leave the science for another video, but it gets forced downward and uh, you have this current of dry air that usually creates uh, and clear, it clears out a little slot near the mesocyclone region that we call a clear slot or RFD cut and the wall cloud or mesocyclone region of the storm usually forms at the interface of this RFD and the forward flank uh, downdraft gust front. So that is what the rear flank downdraft is. And so we, we had a pretty classic look here to this storm. Some rain curtains in here, a little bit murky from our view, but I uh, believe this did produ was perhaps was producing a tornado at this time as it crossed the state line near Sweetwater, Oklahoma, and eventually toward Cheyenne, Oklahoma. So uh, interesting evolution. Then we started to see the cold front light up behind it. You'll see, let me back this up a little bit, very rapid growth of storms along that cold front as it started to overtake the dry line. Quick transition to a linear complex behind it. Still some supercells out ahead of it. Those would eventually merge with the line as this line was moving very, very fast. Saw some warnings showing storm speeds of 90 plus miles an hour. So very rapid storm motions here. And the southern portion of the line was the one to watch, as that was going to be closer to that northward surging moisture pool, those 60s dew points. So the instability, the moisture was a little bit better down farther to the south, and therefore the, that area was the area to watch. Let me switch over to the Frederick radar here. So here we have the Frederick, Oklahoma radar. And you'll notice right in here, this was an area of concern as it moved into Oklahoma. What appears to be an embedded supercell within the line took shape, and this produced a strong tornado down by Lone Wolf and Hobart, Oklahoma. We showed that just earlier. This was the Lone Wolf tornado, and then as it moved toward Hobart, this was a nice, produced a nice cone there. A little bit difficult to see as it got a little bit wrapped in rain, but a fairly photogenic tornado. Uh, that was from this embedded supercell within the line, and that was very near that moisture gradient of those 60s dew points there down in southwest Oklahoma. Perhaps that, that aided a little bit in producing an, an embedded supercell within this solid line here, but that was our first significant uh, or notable tornado in Oklahoma, and the line would quickly move off toward the east. Here's a wrap model proximity sounding from Hobart, Oklahoma at 1Z, so just before the tornadoes occurred. Very similar situation to our uh, southwest Kansas storms, but a lot more instability here, approaching 1,000 joules per kilogram of mixed layer cape. But that inversion was definitely in play, although by this time the cold front was producing such strong lift and forcing along it that that was no match, that the cap was no match for these storms. That cold front was able to force through that stable layer. And because we had such significant uh, kinematics here, look at just look at this hodograph. This is, this is nuts. Um, zero to one kilometer storm relative velocity of almost 800 meters squared per second squared, zero to three, over a thousand meters squared per second squared. That is that is just obscene uh, helicity amounts. And you can see in the hodograph there, very strong veering in these low level winds, winds at uh, just about a kilometer off the surface, about seven, 65 to 70 knots there. And those were number one being transported down to the surface through downdrafts within the uh, derecho, this, the, the more uh, linear portion of this derecho or squall line. And in these embedded supercells, this was leading to a, a tornado threat um, in those storms. So very, very potent kinematics with this system. 
A um, little bit more instability down to the south, though, as we said. 65 over 60. There's our 60-degree dew points down in southwest Oklahoma. A little bit more favorable environment for tornadoes, uh, and therefore that embedded supercell was able to produce tornadoes near uh, Hobart. <laughs> Given those kinematics, not surprising at all. Very interesting um, progression with these, super, these embedded supercells within the line and these supercells that got caught by the line. What would happen... Interestingly, with these supercells would produce the tornadoes, and then they would get thrown toward the back of the line in somewhat of a bookend vortex uh, type initiation or formation mechanism. We've talked about bookend vortices before, that you have this rotation, takes on sort of a comma head feature, and you can have tornadoes from this bookend vortex feature within the line that often happens after a supercell merges with the line or you have an embedded supercell within the line. So a little bit of a bookend vortex structure there. Very strong winds within this line as well. Some reports of 80, 90, 100 mile an hour winds within this line. There were some photos of some street signs, of a street sign embedded in a door frame in Duncan, Oklahoma, as this line passed through. So very potent, uh, what would become a serial derecho with some embedded supercells within it. So the line continued to move off to the east in the general direction of the Oklahoma City metro area. If we look at our velocity data here, you'll notice some extremely strong winds being profiled by the radar. And we've talked about this before, but some of these winds were so strong that they have been aliased by the radar. And here's our radar site. Greens indicate inbound winds going toward the radar. Reds are going away from the radar. Well, this area right in here, these, should, these are moving toward the radar, but they're registering as outbound winds. Well, that's because, as we talked about before, folding or aliasing involves the radar having a maximum velocity that it, it can read. And once it hits that, it folds over to the other end of the scale and goes down from there. So in this case, these should be inbound winds. So we go out to our maximum velocity, which is in this case 70 knots. And they've hit that 70 knot threshold there above that. So we fold back up to our other end of the scale and we start going down here. And these are looking like something in maybe the 50 or 40 knot range. So something right in here in this particular area. That would be 70 knots, we fold over, plus another 30 knots, we'll say. So these are registering 100 knot winds here, uh, just a little bit off the surface. We're not terribly far from the radar site. So these have been aliased here because they're so strong, and these were measuring about 100 knot winds, which are very, very strong winds just above the surface. These were easily being transported down to the surface. And just to reiterate, these strong winds in the low and mid-levels of the atmosphere get transported downward to the surface through downdrafts. That's what we call momentum transport. When you have very strong winds aloft and you have storms that are producing downdrafts, those winds can be transported to the surface, as, and that's how we get very strong winds, like in this case, uh, to get down to the surface. So very strong straight-line winds as the line moved off toward Oklahoma City. But interestingly enough, this northern portion right here, just south of I-40, seem to be a little bit separated from the rest of the line to its south, which was interesting to note. Not 100% sure why that is. Uh, usually, devolution into more semi-discrete elements involves a reorganization of the shear vectors with respect to the ongoing uh, line slash initiating boundary uh, or a, uh, you know, a lessening of the forcing. Uh, in, over a given area. None of those seem to happen with this particular case. So it was interesting to note that this northern portion seemed to be a little bit more isolated, still not by any means a discrete supercell at this point, about 2.30Z, so 8.30 p.m. Still not a discrete supercell at this point, but it did seem that this portion of the line was um, a little bit out ahead of the rest of the line to its south and away from any storms to its north. So that was something to note. And as it approached Oklahoma City, we started to get some interesting uh, clues that this might become the area of mischief within this main line. So first off, you have this, what appears to be some sort of isolated supercell structure up here, just south of I-40 heading toward Mustang and Yukon, western portions of the OKC metro area. And this actually produced a couple of tornadoes. You can see there just a couple of you know, supercell-ish structures in there, which is very interesting, very weird placement for those to be somewhat on the back side of the line. Not really a true classic comma head or bow echo shape with this, uh, which is very unique. So very unique uh, presentation on radar here that these actually produce some tornadoes. This is a still shot from my buddy Max Olson who was chasing up north on the um, those tornadoes up there. Very visible funnel, which is unusual as well, but as you, uh, with these somewhat QLCS spin-ups, but as we saw, 
they were more so um, discrete or semi-discrete supercells rather than just kinks along the line, which is very interesting. So those produced a couple of tornadoes as they crossed I-40. Saw I saw a bunch of power flashes there as we were sitting in west, far west Oklahoma, Oklahoma City. Saw some power flashes off to our north, the couple of tornadoes up there. But I was beginning to become quite nervous about this southern storm right in here, just to the south of the ongoing tornado producers up there by Yukon and Mustang. This was becoming apparent that it was going to be a... Uh, a legitimate embedded supercell, not even an embedded supercell. You can see it is by this point, just after 9 p.m., it is basically fully separated from the line, still connected somewhat to the precipitation down here, but the rest of this line really has nothing to do with this supercell. So you could call this not even an embedded supercell, more so somewhat of a discrete or semi-discrete supercell at this point. Now, I started becoming nervous because it started to take on this uh, very strong precipitation core with an appendage sticking out to the south that wrapped up quite quickly as, as it approached the I-35 corridor, started to wrap inward, and that's when I thought that areas of South Norman were going to be in trouble. Let's zoom in here on KTLX. This is the KTLX radar with a zoomed-in view. So here we go. We'll start the loop here out by uh, Dibble and Blanchard, you can see that it has a little bit of rotation in it, has that appendage there, not really a tight hook echo, but definitely a precipitation core with a forward flank and then a very strong appendage uh, feature as it was heading toward Norman. Continues off to the northeast and then it starts to really wrap in as it approaches Goldsby and I-35 with some tornado damage extending out far that way. And then we really saw a ramp up in the velocities as it uh, neared south and southeast Norman. Very strong couplet there. And that's where it produced damage just north of where I live. Uh, and then off toward the northeast, it you can very much see a distinct boundary here. This uh, uh, boundary between the reds and the greens, that is some sort of boundary likely part of the gust front associated with this convective complex, perhaps a combination with that, as well as some rear flank downdraft, wrapping into the tornado, helping to intensify it there. Lots of streamlined vorticity ingestion into that supercell, helping to intensify that tornado. Strengthened even more as it moved off to the northeast toward the radar site. We thought the radar site for a while, right in here, KTLX was going to get a direct hit. Thankfully, it did not, but very wrapped up storm. Uh, you can see somewhat maybe of a debris ball right in there. Uh, correlation coefficient showed a very strong debris signature uh, as there's a lot of trees, a lot of homes out there in this particular area of Norman. And it moved out toward the, toward the northeast. And eventually the boundary did surge out ahead of it a little bit and the tornado eventually dissipated just uh, near the radar site before it recycled as it moved toward I-40 just south of McLeod and near Shawnee. It produced another tornado up in there. But you can clearly see by this point the gust front had surged out ahead of the hook echo of this storm, undercutting the mesocyclone and allowing the tornado to dissipate. This is from the KCRI radar, the OU research radar. Um, shows very much a similar thing, very strong looking appendage. We can get a little bit more definition in that hook echo there. Really start, you can start to see it a little bit higher resolution down here southwest of Cole. And then it wraps up near Goldsby. Very strong signature there. A little bit stronger than what the KTLX was showing because closer proximity to the radar. Uh, we get a great image of that as the storm passed by just to the south. And then just a very strong signature moving into east and southeast Norman uh, where it produced the EF2 damage. And we got an even higher resolution view from TOKC, the uh, Terminal Doppler Weather Radar, at the Oklahoma City Airport and you could really see the hook echo start wrapping up on this storm down by coal. There, very, basically a just an appendage at this point, but at the very tip of that, you start to see a very well-defined little tip uh, hook echo type feature as it moved toward coal, and that's when I started to become nervous. We were up here in western Oklahoma City uh, watching those Yukon and Mustang tornadoes. Uh, we were, I was watching this very closely as if it planted, it was going to take it right into southeast Norman, uh, where I live. So I was very nervous at that point. And then you can see by Goldsby, it starts to wrap up very nicely. Very well-defined hook echo there. Very thin hook just west of Goldsby, where it started to produce tornado damage. This is when it's nearing its peak there in south Norman. 
Um, very strong couplet. You can see the uh, boundary there even better feeding up into the mesocyclonic and tornadic circulation and then moves off toward the east with some range folding, so very strong tornado, no doubt. Uh, and then finally, the boundary undercuts the tornado as it moves off to the east, and the tornado uh, essentially occludes somewhat, gets undercut, uh, and dissipates before dropping another one up here along I-40. This shot was taken by my friend, uh, Storm Chaser Brett Wright. He was up on near the University of Oklahoma football stadium looking south at about 9.17 p.m., and you can clearly see a lowering in this region with what appears to be some precipitation underneath it. This was very likely the start of the Norman tornado. If we go to our radar, you can see this This is at 918, the couplet still right back in here. He would be up in uh, this vicinity right in here, so looking toward the south or southwest at it. Um, and that definitely appears to be a lowering associated with the start of the Norman tornado. So very interesting evolution to that storm. Again, I'm not 100% sure why this portion of the line was able to devolve. Now, why was, why was this portion of the line able to produce tornadoes? Well, once again, we talked about the storm mode being a little bit more favorable up here. But it's a little unclear why this would be the favored location otherwise for storms. Let's look at the surface imagery here. This is at 20, this is basically at 0z. You'll notice the 60s dew points down there along the Red River. If we go forward a couple of hours, you'll see the 60s really surge northward into the Oklahoma City metro area and even into northern Oklahoma. And if we follow, if we look closely, you'll see a little bit of a uh, temperature gradient in here. 67 down here at this particular station, 70 down here in Ardmore, 61, I believe that's uh, Ada. Uh, 63 at, I believe that's Seminole, 64 at Oklahoma City. So there did appear to be some sort of boundary in here. This may have been the warm front, draped a little bit here up from the surface low up here down to the south a little bit. Uh, maybe the warm front, maybe some sort of random uh, temperature gradient. But that could have impacted the tornado production of the Norman supercell as the boundary does appear to be very close to where that supercell took place. May have added some uh, vorticity generation, uh, may have generated some vorticity into the environment, the near storm environment, and allowed that to produce a strong tornado there near Norman. Uh, and then quickly moved off toward the northeast. You can see dew points now 64 over 62 here in Seminole. So now very favorable looking uh, low level thermodynamics, at least at the surface for tornadoes as far as the temperature dew point spread goes. But let's look at a proximity sounding. We don't need a model sounding for this. Uh, let's everybody give a round of applause to the National Weather Service office at Norman for launching a, a special balloon at 3Z about 15 to 20 minutes before the tornado impacted Norman. An absolutely fantastic decision to release that balloon. And we got some pretty astounding data from this. First, let's look. Let's ignore the... Uh, obscene looking hodograph for a second. Take a look at the thermodynamics. Same thing in play as we saw out to the west back in southwest Oklahoma and southwest Kansas. Very strong capping inversion in place. You can see that elevated mix layer really entrenched in this profile. 9.3 degrees Celsius average lapse rate in that layer. So very, very steep lapse rates. Very strong elevated mix layer there. Leading to a very significant capping inversion. Now we had moistened quite a bit. Somewhat of a moist layer extending up to about 850 millibars there from the surface. 65 over 62 at KOUN. With some elevated, what appears to be elevated instability. About 600 joules per kilogram of mixed layer cape. But what we talked about is the overall deep layer and low level shear can help drill through that stable layer along with the frontal forcing. Let's get that out of the way. The, the cold front, the forcing from the cold front was so strong that that was very much a factor in pushing that uh, the, these parcels through the cap and really negating any influence that the capping inversion had. Very strong frontal forcing, but my God, let's look at this hodograph. This is, this is a hodograph you re rarely ever see coupled with legitimate instability. Usually this will happen in north of a warm front where there's strong warm advection, but no instability, so no severe weather. Or this will happen, you'll see this in the uh, northeast quadrant of a hurricane where you have such strong low-level winds that it makes a hodograph like this. But to have this in a convective setting in a severe and tornado environment is just remarkable. Zero to one kilometer storm relative helicity of 1,017 meters squared per second squared. Zero to three kilometers storm relative felicity, over 1,100 meters squared per second squared. That is just obscene. Just to put this in perspective, the April 27th, 2011 super outbreak across the southeast, 
there were some photographs in there uh, with observed values approaching um, five, six, seven, eight hundred, maybe even nine hundred meters squared per second squared. And we consider April twenty seventh, twenty eleven, to be the gold standard of tornado outbreaks. This one has even more than that—a thousand. 0 to 1 SRH. That is just unbelievable. This photograph is nuts. Deep layer shear, over 70 knots, so very favorable for severe storms and supercells. But my god, this this photograph is just unbelievable. If we had more instability, if this photograph was paired with, you know, 1500 to 2000 joules per kilogram of cape and we didn't have this inversion to drill through, this would produce some pretty intense tornadoes <laughs> don't really need to go more in detail than that. There would be some pretty nasty tornadoes with this. Thankfully, instability was at bay a little bit, a little bit of a capping inversion to uh, drill through, we kept the strength of the and the uh, frequency or um, account of these tornadoes at bay. But my goodness, that photograph is something to marvel at. Um, just incredible low level veering of those winds with height. You go from 15 knot south southeasterlies at the surface, just a kilometer above the surface at 850 millibars, you have. 75 knot due southerly wind. So you have a little bit of change in direction, as you can see here. So some good veering in those winds in the low levels. But my goodness, the speed shear is ridiculous. Almost 80 knots of low level jet there at a kilometer off the surface. That is unreal. Really stuff you see in the southeast a lot. Not really too much here in the plains. Uh, this was definitely an upper echelon wind profile. Uh, I'm not sure the record for most storm relative felicity in a photograph with, associated with a convective event, but this has to be up there uh, in the at the top. So, just an incredible profile. Congrats and it's excellent job for NWS Norman uh, sending up this balloon just ahead of this tornadic supercell, so we get a really great picture of the environment. The uh, strong forcing from the front, the strong low level, the ridiculous low level and strong deep layer shear able to drill through this stable layer to produce a tornadic supercell on the northern end of the line. So all in all, a very impressive event uh, and one that we will remember for quite a while. Uh, just some absolutely impressive radar imagery um, with this storm, uh, especially that couplet as it moved through southeast Norman. Not something you like to see moving through populated areas, and unfortunately there were some quite heavy damage just off to my north along the track. Uh, they've now officially given it a preliminary rating of EF2. We'll see if they find a little bit higher damage out there, but um, EF2 for now, definitely a strong tornado. Thankfully, uh, some thermodynamic issues kept things at bay a little bit, or else this would have been a long track violent uh, tornado most likely, and we would have had more of these along the line with any semi-discrete or embedded supercells. So that's going to wrap things up. Once again, excellent job to everybody involved with forecasting this event from the Storm Prediction Center by nailing the forecast there um, with this serial derecho. So we've talked about that before. Serial derecho is um, you know usually associated with a long line with multiple areas of damaging winds, but definitely meets that criteria. Long swath of damaging wind with this particular uh, event, especially in the southern mode there. Uh, as well as some tornado reports there along the line uh, with that strong tornado there in Norman uh, and a few others elsewhere. So very interesting event meteorologically, uh, one that we'll uh, remember for a, a long time. And, uh, you know, this could be an omen of what we might see during the spring uh, this year as we head into the next few months. Active pattern looks to continue for, for a little bit. Uh, so hopefully we will not see any more of these damaging tornadoes go through populated areas, but uh, it could be an active start to the spring tornado season if this event is any omen. So with that, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.